Good evening, everyone. Erev Tov. Welcome to the Sun and the Scriptures as we continue our year-long journey through uh, the Torah. And we are in the middle of the book of Exodus, and we'll talk about what portion it is and what verses it covers uh, after we begin with prayer. So let's bow our heads. Baruch Adonai, Eloheinu melech o'elam, asher kedishanu b'misvita v'sevanu le'asok b'divrei Torah. Blessed are you, Lord God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and has commanded us to be immersed into the words and the matters of Torah. Amen. So where we are at in the Torah this week is the portion known as Yitro. Uh, Yitro is just the Hebrew word for the name Jethro. So Jethro is Moses' father-in-law. Uh, and so in Hebrew, his name is Yitro, uh, and it occurs in Exodus chapter 18, verse 1, which is the first verse of the portion, which is the 17th portion of the Torah. Uh, and portion Yitro covers Exodus chapter 18, verse 1, and goes through chapter 20, verse 23. Now, the main thing, the big thing that this portion would be known for is this is where the giving of the so-called Ten Commandments occurs. Um, and I say so-called because the Bible itself does not call them the Ten Commandments. All right, that's very important. It does not call them the Ten Commandments. It's something that's kind of come down to us through tradition. Uh, the Bible does identify them by ten, um, but it literally calls them the Ten Words are the ten ideas, are the ten utterances, comes from the Hebrew word deber. Uh, and so deber can mean word, matter, uh, utterance, concept, idea. Uh, and so that's what it is. And it's interesting um, because when people think it's commandments, it's caused different traditions to number commandments differently. I don't know if you've ever had that opportunity to explore that, but Lutherans have a different numbering than Presbyterians and Baptists and so forth. Like what we would call the Eighth Commandment, they don't call the Eighth Commandment and so forth because it's trying to find what the ten are. And as we're, we'll explore in making it personal this evening, um, the, the proof that they aren't commandments is in Judaism, which I would think would be the one group who would know what they are since it's in their scriptures, that first utterance, that first word, that first concept is not a commandment at all. It is, I am the Lord your God. That's number one. I am the Lord your God. Uh, and so it's really these ten are kind of to be the fractal uh, of the bigger piece. That is, within these ten words, within these ten concepts, all of God's word, all of God's revelation is contained. And so when we get to making it personal, we'll do a very kind of brief way of, of trying to see how they can connect and reflect one another. But they're all going to flow from that very first one, I am the Lord your God. Uh, so that's what Yitro is kind of known for. But because we are in the sun and the scriptures this year, uh, we won't focus too much on the commandments other than in making it personal uh, because what we are looking at in this trip through the Torah is where does the text that week uh, foreshadow, look forward to, explain, uh, have something to do with Messiah, Jesus, the Son. And this week, especially Portia and Yitro, uh, kind of the New Testament at large and the apostolic community. There's a really large connection between um, the giving of the words, the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai that occurs in Portia and Yitro, and one of the most fundamental events in the New Testament, direct connection from them. And so we'll spend some time looking at that and, and, and dialing that in. All right, so uh, what's the kind of summary of the portion? What all happens in Yitro? Well, as I said, Yitro is Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, 
mentioned in Exodus chapter 18, verse 1. And Jethro hears about the great miracles that God had performed for the people of Israel. And so he comes from where he is a priest, where he is a a religious leader uh, from Midian. And he comes to the Israelite camp, and he brings with him Moses' wife and two sons. Jethro then advises Moses to appoint a hierarchy of magistrates and judges to assist him in the task of governing and administering justice to the people. In fact, this is the birth of what you will know in the New Testament as the Sanhedrin. Okay, And another powerful thing about Portion Yitro is uh, Jethro... Um, in the portion and in, in, in the Torah, becomes a follower of Moses, God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But he's not a Hebrew. He's not an Israelite. He's not a Jew. Uh, so he's a Gentile. And so you have a portion of the Hebrew Bible named after a Gentile. And ironically enough, it's the portion where the Ten Commandments are given. Uh, and so the whole idea of the Sanhedrin and having a, a court of law and having what many ways in Western legal society we understand as like, oh, if you've got a small issue, you go to this court. If that doesn't satisfy you, there's a court above that and you can make appeals until you get all the way to the Supreme Court, right? The Supreme Court obviously can't hear every single case in the United States. Um, That's how Jethro wanted Moses to set things up. Like Moses was running himself on empty. Like he couldn't do everything. He couldn't hear everything. He couldn't handle everything. So Jethro says you need to establish this and eventually it becomes a a group of 70, uh, which is where the Sanhedrin comes from. The children of Israel, in this week's portion, they camp opposite Mount Sinai, uh, where they are told that God has chosen them to be his kingdom of priests and that they are to be a holy nation. The people respond by proclaiming all that God has spoken, we shall do. On the sixth day of the third month of Sivan, So the third month in Hebrew calendar, in the biblical calendar, is called Sivan, S-I-V-A-N. On the sixth day of that month, seven weeks after the Exodus event, the entire nation of Israel assembles at the foot of Mount Sinai for the giving of the Torah. So it's really seven weeks and a day after Passover that the children of Israel are gathered at the foot of Mount Sinai where they receive the revelation of the Word of God. Seven times seven plus one is 50. And if you know some Greek and some Latin, you might would say that's a Pentecost. All right? So this is where the biblical origin of Pentecost happens. The world's first Pentecost was not Acts chapter 2. That was about the world's 2,132nd Pentecost. All right? And that's, by the way, why they were gathered in Jerusalem and so forth. So they gathered 50 days after Passover. They received the revelation of God. There's smoke and there's lightning and there's fire, right? And Moses receives the word of God. The rabbis talk about that the the words descended with fire on them in all the languages of the world. Does it sound familiar, right? Uh, Acts chapter 2 is not original. Acts chapter 2 is using all of the imagery, all of the sounds and the sights and the smells of this week's portion. So that's a very important concept for us. Acts chapter 2, rooted in portion Yitro. Uh, In Hebrew, the day is called Shavuot, S-H-A-V-U-O-T, Shavuot, which means weeks, because it's seven weeks and a day after the Passover exodus. There God descends on the mountain amidst thunder, lightning, billows of smoke, a blast of the shofar, and he summons Moses to ascend. It is here again, the the original Pentecost, that God proclaims those ten words, commanding the people of Israel to believe in God, not to worship or take God's name in vain, 
to keep the Sabbath, to honor their parents, not to murder, not to commit adultery, not to steal, not to bear false witness or covet another's property. The people cry out to Moses that this revelation of God, that their experience of God at the Mount of Sinai, that it's too intense for them to bear, that it's too much, and they beg that Moses receive the word of God and then that Moses would be the intermediary and convey it to the people. A foreshadow, of course, of our Messiah who takes upon himself the fullness of the law, the fullness of the word of God on our behalf. All right, so that's the summary. That's the Goodyear blip. And so uh, for us, again, taking the theme, the Son and the Scriptures, um, let's spend some more time looking at this idea of the connection of Pentecost and Sinai. Pentecost and Portia Nitro. So let's look at Exodus chapter 19, verse 1. There it says, In the third month, After the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. So does the word Pentecost or Pentecostal, does it sound familiar to you? It probably does. You probably have heard the word Pentecost. You may have uh, attended or grown up in or know people who attend a Pentecostal church. I always find it kind of interesting that those who are Pentecostal, when you talk to them about the Pentecost of the Old Testament, they've never heard of it, right? Their understanding of what Pentecost and Pentecostal is, is something completely different, born in 19th and 20th century evangelicalism in the United States of America. It's not rooted actually in the scriptures. Uh, So most of us have heard the term Uh, And most Christians probably know the story of a Pentecost um, that's recorded for us in the New Testament. Uh, I'm thinking in Acts chapter 2. There the mighty wind, the tongues of fire, the Holy Spirit, uh, the ability to speak and or hear in your own language or in the languages of the world. Most, however, unaware of the significant background to that story. So what's the background to Acts chapter 2? The church holiday known as Pentecost is not originally a church holiday at all. It is a much older festival that predates Christianity by around 14, 1500 years. Okay? Uh, In fact, it's described in the Torah as one of the three pilgrimage festivals. So, in the book of Leviticus, as well as in Deuteronomy, and we'll read one of those passages, it says that the the men of Israel, on Passover, on what's known as Tabernacles, or Sukkot, or Booths, goes by all those names, and on Shavuot or Pentecost, that those three festivals, if it's within your means, if it's within your ability, are to be celebrated where uh, the tabernacle and eventually where the temple resides, which becomes Jerusalem, that everyone's to travel to it. So it's one of the three pilgrimage festivals, which is why in Acts chapter 2, people are there from all over the world, right? They came originally probably for Passover. So you've got to imagine if you're going to travel from modern-day Libya, northern Africa, which is basically by foot and by caravan on horse or camel, you're going to travel from northern Africa to Jerusalem, the old school way, like on your foot for Passover. And the next pilgrimage festival you're required to attend is just 50 days later. You're probably going to stay those 50 days, right? Um, Probably going to stay put there. And so all of those who came for Passover that were there, Uh, for uh, Jesus' passion and all of that, like they're there also at Pentecost. And so they're from all of the nations. They all stream there. What better place for that event to happen, right? Because you're going to get the maximum kind of 
That's the way word would spread. That was your social media then because people from all over the world, from Italy, from Northern Africa, from Europe, uh, from Asia, they would all hear and experience it. Then they would go home. And what would they do once they got home? Tell you what happened, right? And so that's Pentecost. That's Shavuot. In Christianity today, Pentecost is most famous as the day the tongues of fire descended upon the believers. So this is Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. It says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Now you know why they were all together in one place, and you know where that one place is. They were all together in one place. They were all in Jerusalem. They were all in the Temple Mount. They were all in Solomon's portico because they were all there celebrating for the 14th, 1500th time, year in a row, Portion Yitro and the giving of the Torah, the giving of the Word of God. It says, Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. That's images from Sinai in this week's portion. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came and rested on each of them. That's straight from the midrash of what happened in Portia Nitro. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now today Christians can kind of disagree about the meaning of those four verses, yet looking into the older meaning of Pentecost, can provide clarification for us. The Jewish believers in Acts chapter 2 knew quite a bit more about Pentecost than we do because they had been celebrating it every year all of their lives. Long before the tongues of fire fell upon those believers in Jerusalem on that day, fire fell upon Mount Sinai. So the very first Pentecost happened at Mount Sinai. What's happening in Acts chapter 2? It's like the July 4th celebration. It's the celebration of Portion Yitro. Israel arrived in the desert of Sinai on the third day of the third month, as the Torah says, uh, as we read in Exodus 19, verse 1. And three days later, on the sixth day of the third month, God descended onto Mount Sinai and revealed himself to them in his word, specifically in those ten words. And he came in a blazing fire, heralded by the loud blast of the shofar. And that word shofar gets translated into your English Bibles as the trumpet. All those trumpets in your Bible really are shofars. According to the Pharisaic reckoning of the calendar, the sixth day of the third month is the day of Pentecost. The Feast of Pentecost is the anniversary of the day that God gave Israel the Torah at Sinai. And so Pentecost is a biblical holiday filled with wealth of meaning and symbolism. For as long as the temple stood in Jerusalem, all of the men were commanded to make pilgrimage there and to worship God at the feast of Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16. Three times a year all your males shall appear before their Lord your God in the place which he chooses. In the Old Testament, in the Torah, the place which he chooses originally means where the tabernacle rests, where the Ark of the Covenant rests, which ultimately finds its permanent resting spot in Jerusalem. And what are those three times a year? The Feast of Unleavened Bread, Passover, uh, the Feast of Weeks, 50 days later, Shavuot, and the Feast of Booths, our Sukkot, our tabernacles, which happens in the fall, usually mid-September to early October. Uh, Pentecost is one of the appointed times. It's one of the Moed, the Moedim, uh, the divine appointments that God has written into his annual calendar. It's covered also not only here in Deuteronomy 16, but in Leviticus chapter 23. Uh, there he says, these are my appointed times. These are my appointments, says the Lord, as he tells the children of Israel. And believers throughout the book of Acts kept God's festivals and they celebrated his appointments. Today, Pentecost is really the only actual biblical festival that is remembered and sometimes observed as part of the church calendar. Interesting, isn't it? But that's the only remnant left where the calendar God gave in Leviticus and Deuteronomy is also in the church's calendar. The others, Passover, Unleavened Bread, 
Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Kippur, and the Feast of Tabernacles have long ago vanished from the church's liturgical year. They disappeared only a few generations after the apostles. Yet because of the strength of Acts 2, Pentecost still occupies an important place in the church's lection. Uh, as I have mentioned before, Pentecost means 50. The festival is called Pentecost because it comes 50 days after the Sabbath of unleavened bread. In the Hebrew, it's called the Feast of Weeks, Shavuot, because it's seven weeks and a day after the unleavened bread. Acts chapter 2, the festival of Pentecost already carried extra significance for the believers because it also came not only 50 days after the Passover Sabbath, but for those believers, it was 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus. And so that's actually how the church marks Passover. Judaism to this day still counts 50 days after Passover. The church counts 50 days after Easter Sunday. Pentecost is also a harvest festival, so it fits in with their calendar not only religiously, but it was part of, as they were a group of nomads and farmers and shepherds and people of the land, it fits in with their actual kind of work calendar. Pentecost was a harvest festival when the farmers of the land of Israel were to bring the first fruits of their vineyards and orchards to Jerusalem. Uh, and that has a tie-in uh, with Jesus because Jesus is called the first fruits of the resurrection. In fact, the disciples and followers of Jesus were themselves the first fruits of Jesus' ministry. And so on Pentecost in the book of Acts, 3,000 were added to their number, and there was a great harvest of souls that began then. So Exodus chapters 19 and 20, the story of the giving of the Ten words are the so-called Ten Commandments and the covenant given at Sinai. That is the original story of Pentecost. That is the root of Pentecost. As the disciples of the risen Messiah gathered to celebrate Shavuot in Jerusalem, they were gathering to celebrate this traditional anniversary of the giving of the Torah. And you can even see hints of that in Acts because it talks about them uh, when they gathered that they were of one mind and of one accord. And that is alluding to the description that the children of Israel were described as in portion Yitro. That when they were at the foot of Mount Sinai, the subjects are in the plural, but the verbs are in the singular, which is grammatically incorrect, right? To have a plural subject but a singular verb. But it does that on purpose to show that the plurality of the people were of one mind and of one accord, so they were as a single person, so they take the singular verb. And what brought them into that unity? It was gathering at Sinai and receiving the Torah. And so that is what was uniting the disciples of Jesus as well. So that's the original background of Pentecost. That's why the disciples were there. That's why it was an opportune moment for the gospel and the spirit to descend. Let's keep looking at the text again with these eyes of the Son and the Scriptures and the apostolic community. Exodus chapter 19, verse 5, says then there, uh, Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for the earth is mine. And Mount Sinai, what's kind of being described there in the language, and we may miss it because it's not so much our language, but if the language would have been something like, and you will love me in richness and poor, uh, for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, what would you immediately start thinking about by those words? Marriage. All right. That's what you need to know is the language going on in Exodus 19. It's using marriage and marriage vow language that was and still is common in Jewish marriages. And so what you have going on at, in Exodus 19 and 20 at Sinai 
is essentially God officially proposing to his bride, Israel, offering to make them his people, right? Which is, that's the language, that's part of the wedding language. I will be your husband, you will be my wife, you will be my wife, I will be your husband. Um, And part of the marriage ceremony then as well as now is what's known as a ketubah, a wedding contract that says, I will be your husband and here's what I bring to the table. Here's what I will do in the marriage. This is the covenant I'm making with you. And you will be my wife, and these are my expectations of you. And then it reverses. I will be your wife. Here's what I'm bringing to the table. Here are my expectations and of you and so forth. That's what's going on in Exodus 19 and 20. It's very much bride and bridegroom language. In rabbinic literature, Exodus 19 is often spoken of as the betrothal. In this betrothal imagery, God is compared to the suitor and the bridegroom. um, And Israel, of course, is the bride. The Torah is their ketubah, their wedding contract. And Moses, Moses fulfills a function in Jewish weddings that's still around today. He is the liaison between God and the people. Um, in marriage ceremonies, the liaison between the bride and the groom is called the friend of the bridegroom. That's the technical term. Like, and again, if I use language like maid of honor or best man, right, you would know what I'm talking about. Friend of the bridegroom has that type of ringing in the ear in the ancient Near East. It's the person who... Uh, communicated between them. He's the individual who brings the bride and presents the bride to the groom on the day of the wedding. He's the individual that's kind of in charge of everything and making sure everything works all right, including protecting and watching over the bride until the time of the wedding. So in Jewish wedding customs, the friend of the bridegroom was the intermediary between the couple. It was the friend of the bridegroom's job to present the bride to the groom. And Moses filled this role by leading the people to Mount Sinai and conducting the negotiations, if you will, the ketubah, the wedding contract, between God and Israel. In our kind of services that we're familiar with, we might, have re- we might recognize a couple signing the marriage license. Um, but I've officiated because... As an ordained rabbi, I've officiated at Jewish weddings. The rabbi actually sits down with the couple uh, at the wedding ceremony and negotiates the contract with the couple, which nowadays means he kind of reads the contract, like what they're promising to do for one another and so forth, and making sure all parties are in agreement. And then they sign, and the rabbi signs, and then the wedding begins. When at the last Uh, Finally, the Lord descends on Mount Sinai. Moses led the people out of the camp and to the foot of Mount Sinai. In other words, he was presenting the bride to the bridegroom. As the friend of the bridegroom, Moses was responsible for negotiating the match. And he brings the bridegroom's proposal to the girl. Through Moses, God offers to make Israel his own possession. We'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Uh, but his own possession among all the peoples of the world, that they would be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now, when we look at this and then we look into the Gospels, we see that John the Baptist actually speaks of himself in a very similar way. Once John's disciples came to him and they warned him that this guy Jesus was gaining in popularity and that His disciples were baptizing. And so John's disciples felt as if Jesus was infringing on their ministry, taking people from their congregation, if you will, to which John corrects them and points out that he was only the friend of the bridegroom, that he was only the forerunner of the Messiah. Just as the friend of the bridegroom gets out of the way, relinquishing the girl in his charge to the bridegroom, so too John was relinquishing his ministry to Jesus. So John alludes back to this Mount Sinai moment in portion Yitro by comparing the people of Israel to a bride, himself to the friend of the bridegroom, and Jesus, the Torah, the Word made flesh, right, as the bridegroom. 
So listen to these words from John chapter 3. This is John the Baptist. A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I've been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase as I must decrease. Let's keep looking in Exodus chapter 19, especially at that phrase that in the ketubah, the wedding contract, that the people, that the bride will be a possession. That kind of sounds, who wants to be a possession? So what's, what's, what's behind this? So Exodus chapter 19 in the fifth verse, God says in his terms, you shall be my own possession among all the peoples. For all the earth is mine and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. What the Lord actually says is that he will take Israel to be his segula in Hebrew, which doesn't mean possession kind of in the negative or pejorative way, but it means treasured possession, right? That's different, right? As I've talked about before, segula is one of my favorite words in the Hebrew language because what it really means is your segula is that one thing you would save in your house if it were on fire. Outside of living things, outside of people and pets and those sorts of things that are obvious and no-brainers, if your house is on fire, they say you can go in and you can get one thing, only one thing, what would you get? Again, people are fine, pets are fine, anything living is fine. What would you get? Chances are you wouldn't get your checkbook, Chances are you wouldn't grab your stack of $100 bills hidden above the refrigerator. Chances are you wouldn't grab the loaf of bread or your favorite leftovers. Uh, you probably wouldn't grab uh, just clothes, right? Those, those wouldn't be things you would immediately get one thing to keep. Everything else is destroyed. What is it? It may not be something of great material value, right? It could be... Uh, you know, your first child's baby shoes. It could be, you know, you name it. What, what is that, though? Whatever the that is, that's your secula. And that's what God says that, they, that his bride will be. That he, the world were burning down. He could only save one thing. It would be you. Right? That's the secula. Um, his special treasure. He says that even though he owns the whole earth, that his bride will be his special treasure, that they will be a kingdom of priests, a holy people, that they will be unique, that they will be special, that they will be set apart, that they will be put on a pedestal. Israel is to be his bride. Now, within the church, we often refer to ourselves as the bride. But if you do a deep dive into Scripture, you will find out the bride is Israel and those who graft themselves into Israel through faith in the promised bride of Messiah. Out of all the peoples on the earth, out of all the nations, God entered into this covenant with only one people and only one nation. That nation was Israel. God did not call the Swedes to Mount Sinai. Not the Irish, the Italians are not a holy nation, not the French, not the Americans. And we could go a step further and point out that God didn't call any Baptists, Lutherans, Methodists, or Catholics to Mount Sinai. God made a covenant with one people on earth. Where then does that leave the Gentiles and those outside of that nation? If a Gentile wants to enter into this relationship with the God of Israel... They enter into the covenant that God has made with his people. How does a person enter into this covenant? The same way Israel entered into that covenant. By agreeing to hear. To hear the voice of God. Exodus 19.5 Now then, if you will indeed hear my voice, then you shall be my possession among all the peoples. 
Jesus himself actually invokes this teaching. Uh, when he speaks of the Gentile inclusion in his ministry. Gentile inclusion was a major part of Jesus' ministry. And he alludes to what's going on here in Exodus 19. In John chapter 10, verse 16, he says these words. I have other sheep, right? Because sheep are Israel. He says, I have other sheep, which are not of this fold, i.e. the Gentiles. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice. Notice here, the word here, say, there you go. And they will become one flock with one shepherd. Notice there's only one flock, and participation in the flock is based upon hearing the shepherd's voice, just as it was for Israel in Exodus 19, just as it is for the other sheep that Jesus calls out for. It's about hearing the shepherd's voice. Jew and Gentile alike enter by agreeing to hear God's voice. And when by God's grace, one is enlightened to the gift of the covenant of salvation through Messiah and his passion, and by placing faith in him, he then leads that person into the one flock. Keep going in Exodus 19 here with the trumpet at Sinai. Exodus 19, verse 19. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. In the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul tells us to anticipate the so-called last trumpet that will be sounded at Messiah's coming. At the blasting of that last trumpet, he says in 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 51, the dead will be raised. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will all be changed. Now, if there is a last trumpet, that means there also has to be a first trumpet. What then is the very first trumpet? It is the first trumpet to which the last trumpet is an echo, as if one trumpeter is calling and a second answering from across the millennia. The first trumpet sound was none other than here in portion Yitro at Mount Sinai on the occasion of the giving of the Torah. As the scripture says, Exodus 19, verse 16. And so it came about on the third day when it was morning that there were thunder and lightning, flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain, and a very loud trumpet sound, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Now, as I said, this trumpet was actually the shofar, the ram's horn trumpet. And that first one that's echoed in the last one The first one is the blast of Exodus 19. The Torah records that while the mountains smoked and trembled with lightning and thunder and darkness and clouds, the sound of the shofar, the trumpet, grew louder and louder. When a human being sounds a trumpet, the blast on the trumpet begins loudly but grows softer and softer as the person's breath expires. But not so with God. His spirit, his wind, his ruach, his breath is infinite. And so he doesn't lose his breath. And so the blast grows louder and louder. In ancient Israel, the shofar was used to herald a king. The fanfare at Mount Sinai heralds the arrival of the king entering into the world that he created. Prior to that moment, God had remained hidden, undisclosed, as it were, removed from the world that he had created. That's part of what the big deal of Sinai is. Because until that point, you, you've got to think about it. Think about how much you take it for advantage. That you have a Bible, that you have the Word of God, that you have kind of the infinite creator of heaven and earth and all of the mysteries that he has given that to you in a form of a book that you can read and with effort understand and study. But before Sinai, God had not been revealed that way. It kind of is foreshadowing the incarnation when the infinite becomes comprehensible to the finite, when something beyond grasp becomes within your grasp. 
That's what happened at Sinai. In fact, the, the Midrash of Sinai talks about that, that God had told, uh, and that was the original meaning behind, you've, you know, you've heard Moses uh, had problems with speech. And supposedly, people say that many, he stuttered or he was afraid of public speaking and all kinds of things like that. Uh uh, that wasn't what the problem was. The problem was he'd seen the burning bush. He'd gone up on Mount Sinai, right, on multiple occasions for 40 days at a time. So he clearly got more than 10 words. And then God said, Now go down and tell them about, tell them all that stuff. And Moses was like, I don't even know where to begin. That was his speech problem. He had no words for what he had seen and experienced, for what he had been taught. He had no words for it. That's what the Midrash says his speech problem was. And maybe you've had an experience like that. I know I've had experience like that. So often when I would travel to Israel by myself and study, I would come back and course the small talk would be well well how was your trip right and i'm like i i can't i can't i can't tell you i have no idea i can't put into words what my trip was like the things i experienced the things i learned and then even if i try and i tell you well you know i met this amazing guy in tiberius and we spent 14 straight hours studying scripture together without a break without even drink you might be kind of like mm-hmm you know, it's kind of interesting, yeah. You know, and I, here it's like, for me, it's, it changed my world. And you're like, oh, sounds like you had a good time. Yeah, right, right. I've got, I don't have the word power to tell you. Paul talks about this in Corinthians when he says, I was swept up into the third heaven. Like, I don't, I can't tell you. Or, or he says, amen, he's meaning himself. But like, I, there's no language for that. And so Moses then comes back to God and says, I, I don't have language for that. I got a speech problem. The human language can't handle that, doesn't have the vocabulary for it. So God says, fine, come back up, and I'm going to put it down for you in my word. And that's God coming down to us in his word. That's what Sinai is. Because before that, there was no word like that. So it's amazing. It's an amazing event that happened there. And so that's what's going on in Exodus. And so um, that's what was sounded. And so at Mount Sinai, this great singular event, God enters the created world. His feet touches the mountain, as the Torah says, Exodus 19, verse 11. The Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all people. He does that through his word. Again, all this is foreshadowing the great incarnation where the word becomes flesh, dwelt among us. Exodus 24.10, they saw the God of Israel and under his feet appeared to be the pavement of sapphire as clear as the sky itself. In other words, at Sinai, the people had an experience of God unlike they had ever had before because they encountered the power of his word. Making it personal. So making it personal, uh, kind of talk about maybe some other things outside of the Son and Scripture theme that occur in the portion. And so when you get a portion where the, the Ten Commandments occur, we've got to talk a little bit about it. Um, but I always like to begin making it personal kind of with a little story to help us relate. One night... Four students stayed out late, completely disregarding the big test they had on the next day. Before school the next morning, they hatched a brilliant plan to avoid taking their test. They covered themselves with grease and dirt, and they went to the principal's office, and they told him all about how their car had gotten a flat tire the previous night on their way home from a wedding, and how they had to spend the whole night pushing it home. The principal listened attentively to their tale of woe, and he kindly offered them a retest on the following day. The students gratefully accepted the offer and spent the whole night studying in anticipation of the big test. 
When they arrived at the principal's office the next morning, he separated them into four different rooms, one student per room, and he handed them their test papers. The test only had two questions. The first question worth one point. What is your name? The second question worth 99 points. Which tire pops? Truth. Truth is powerful. And truth is crucial. And truth is one of the core values in a Torah biblical worldview. Without truth, we lack a higher purpose. Without truth, we lack a foundation to our existence. And in the portion Yitro, Israel hears the ultimate truth. They hear the word of God. They hear the ten words, the synopsis, all of God's word and revelation contained in ten ideas or thoughts. And they hear this as they embrace their new lofty mission in the world, that they are to be kingdom of priests, holy and consecrated to the Lord, that they are to be a light to the nations. These words... These ten words, um, historically in Judaism, they're actually viewed as being on sapphire cubes. That's a different Torah class in the archives for you. Tonight, we're going to focus in on how they're often portrayed in most churches or synagogues um, and a little bit behind that reasoning. So they're often depicted in what looks kind of like this. Uh, with two tablets, five on each side, unless you're Lutheran, they like to do three and seven, right? Because they're Lutherans. But usually it's five and five, and usually it has the round on the top. Now, there's a reason for that artistically. It doesn't mean it was that way originally. As I said, the Jewish tradition is they were sapphire cubes, and God kind of engraved in them Uh, the commandments the artistic representation this way is because when you look at those two semicircles at the top what does that kind of look like the top of think about the shape of a heart and that becomes important that's what that image is supposed to make you think of it's supposed to make you think of a heart because the book of proverbs talks about taking the torah the words of god and engraving them on your heart. And the word it uses in Proverbs for engraving is what God did when he wrote this on Sinai. So our heart is to become the tablet. right? So that's kind of trying to make a tablet look kind of heart-like. And then you have these, again, five words uh, on each side. Uh, And as I said, they're not commandments because the very first one, which would be, as you're looking at it, on the right side, the top, which says, Anoki Adonai, I am the Lord your God. Uh, often it even just says, Anoki, I, or I am. That's number one. Um, but it has five on one side, five on the other. The obvious question then arises, why are the words, the ideas, the thoughts split into two separate groups, the right side and the left side? Why fragment the ultimate expression of oneness into two separate pieces? The commentators offer a myriad of explanations, including one side is your duties to God, your obligations to God, and the other side is your obligation to your fellow man. That this, the one side is your vertical relationship, the other side is your horizontal relationship. And there's lots of commentators and lots of comments and, and so forth in that direction, and many more. But tonight, I want to focus on one of the devotional ways to look at it, where we see how God's Word is united, and it is one testimony of truth. So what I want to focus in on is that each individual commandment on the right side parallels and corresponds to the one on the left. So what that would mean is one has an intimate, deep connection to number six. Two has an intimate and deep connection to number seven. 
so forth and so on, to five has an intimate and deep connection with ten. That one informs the other, the other informs the one. Right? And so that gives you some devotional thought of what is one saying. What the real reason you want to do that, again, is you want to explore how everything really flows from that top one. I am the Lord your God. So I want to briefly give some highlights of looking into it that way, only to kind of foster your own devotion, because the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words, we think we know them, but again, we can't even agree on their numbering, so how well do we know them, right? So we, things we tend to think we know, we also tend not to look at and study, and therefore don't really know so well. So this week would encourage you to kind of spend some time with them, read about them, read what others have taught about them, review your catechism on them, and so forth, because all of reality is right there. And those ten words. It's the summary. So the first word, or quote, commandment, from the Torah, from the Jewish reckoning, is Anochi Adonai Elohecha. I am the Lord your God. Which is the statement that establishes God as the life force of the world. The source of reality. The statement requires us to recognize this fundamental truth and to commit to living a life faithful to it. The first word on the left side that parallels it, numero six, if you will, which parallels I am the Lord your God, is the Hebrew word uh, lo tzirzach, tzirzach, which is the prohibition against murder. God created each and every human being with a spark of divine from above. And so killing another human being eliminates that spark from the world. I am the Lord expresses the ultimate source of life and existence, while murder is the ultimate shattering of existence. Furthermore, the ability to take away life belongs only to the one who gives life. Murdering another person claims the power and authority to eliminate a person's life, and therefore is essentially claiming that I am the Lord, the controller of life. Accordingly, murder directly contradicts the truth of I am the Lord your God, and that God alone is the source of this world and everything in it. But once the primary principle of I am the Lord is established, the logical next step is ensuring that we are faithful to that truth. Many think of idolatry, which is the second commandment, the second word. Many people think of idolatry as the worship of statutes or inanimate objects. And in one respect, it certainly can be that. But any intelligent person can see that a piece of wood or stone carved out by a human being really doesn't hold any power. The deeper understanding behind idolatry, as the Rambam or the Ram call and many others explain, idolatry is really reliance or trust in anything or anyone ahead of trust in God. Anything that you trust in, turn to, rely on, think about, dwell on, meditate upon, go to first, that's, and it's not God, that's idolatry. God created the world in such a way that there are levels of reality. God is the ultimate source and all other resources, sources, people, they all receive their energy from him and then manifest into the world. Idolatry is really when you don't recognize God as the source of everything. So when you fail to recognize that God is behind everything, you've entered into the realm of idolatry. The giving of the commandment established a marriage to God as we've talked about. And idolatry is the betrayal of that commitment and connection of that marriage. Thus, the prohibition against adultery is the corresponding commandment on the left side that parallels with idolatry. Um, adultery is unfaithfulness in marriage, betraying the trust and loyalty integral to the relationship. Any illicit relationship is a breakdown of what proper relationships represent. Therefore, idolatry and adultery 
are inherently connected. And you'll see this throughout the Old Testament. God is constantly accusing his bride of committing adultery. And how did they commit adultery? Because they chased after other gods. They chased after other sources. And again, it wasn't just statues and other religions. It's when they decided, when God would say, look, I know it looks like you're really outnumbered, and I know it really looks like Assyria is going to come and conquer you, but all you got to do is trust me. I fight your battles. Trust me. And then the king has to say, oh, yeah, no. We're going to go ahead and make this geopolitical alliance with these five nations because when we have the strength of these five nations and we have their chariots, i.e. their tanks and their military, we will then be invincible. That's idolatry. And God also calls that adultery because you have betrayed him. And that's what the famous passage in Isaiah 7 about there will be a child born to a virgin, right? King Uzziah is in this conundrum. And Isaiah comes to him and says, you don't have to do anything. God will fight the battle. But we know that's hard for you to believe, Uzziah, so God has said, test him. You have permission to test God. He's giving you permission. He's giving you a blank check. Ask him for any sign. There's nothing too high. There's nothing too deep. There's nothing too wide. You ask for anything on planet Earth to assure you that God is with you and you don't need to do anything and you certainly don't need to enter into a relationship with other nations. And Uzziah says in his pride, I will ask for no sign. To which then Isaiah says, oh, you're going to get a sign. The virgin will give birth to a son. So adultery, idolatry kind of have the parallel. The third word of the ten words is prohibition against using God's name in vain. While the corresponding commandment or word is the prohibition against stealing. But there you need to know a little bit of Hebrew. The word isn't just stealing or theft. It's also the same word for kidnapping. And the practical connection between the two is explained in the Mechita, which states that the one who kidnaps or steals will then have to swear falsely to cover up his tracks, that they will have to take God's name in vain. Uh, The word there also for vain, it doesn't just mean saying like the very crass GD and things like that. It also means uselessly, uselessly, or carelessly. And so that's like those times where you're playing golf and you hit a great tee shot and you're like, praise Jesus, right? Well, are you really praising Jesus or have you just carelessly used that? That's taking it in vain uselessly using the name. Um, And so those who steal or those who kidnap inevitably have to carelessly use God's name to try to convince others that they haven't done their act. The fourth word on the right side of the tablets is the commandment to remember and guard the Sabbath. While the fourth word on the left side is the prohibition against false testimony in court. The parallel between these two is the use of testimony and speech. The Sabbath is when we testify that God created and God runs the world. He realigns and reconnects to this truth and correcting any false perceptions that we may have developed throughout the week. False testimony is a corruption of this principle, using testimony to distort the truth. And the final pairing uh, has to deal with honoring parents and not coveting or not being jealous. While some consider the prohibition of coveting to be transgressed when one acts upon their thoughts of jealousy, many consider even the thoughts and the feelings of jealousy as a violation of the prohibition. How is it possible for us to avoid these thoughts? Each one of us is entrusted with a unique mission in this world. That's one of the truths of the Torah. It's one of the truths that comes through actually in Yitro when God makes his people to be this holy nation, to be this kingdom of priests, that 
We all have been given our own unique mission in this world. And God is our source and therefore the source of everything we have. And every aspect of our life has been designed specifically for us to accomplish our mission. When we understand that every single aspect of our life is given to us in order to help us, what another person has should become irrelevant to us. Jealousy should become nonsensical. Because if we needed it to accomplish our purpose, we would have it. And because we don't have it, it means we don't need it. But it does mean they need it. Nothing that somebody else has is necessary for your mission. And you are the only person who's able to fulfill your unique purpose. God not only gave you your mission, but he also gave you all the tools you need to achieve it. Instilling an understanding in ourselves allows us to live without any feelings of jealousy as our full focus becomes directed towards maximizing our time in this world to fulfill our potential. Nobody else's successes affects our success, nor should it diminish our self-worth. There is no room for jealousy when we're all working toward a shared mission. On the contrary, we should celebrate each other's victories. And this is what honor your father and mother teaches us. The importance of tracing everything in our life back to its source, which ultimately is God. When we realize that our entire existence in this world and all the circumstances and challenges that we face, that they all come from God, there is no place for jealousy. As I said, the shape of the tablets is often with rounded tops to remind us of the heart and the words of Proverbs to engrave these truths upon our hearts. So to do that this week, I thought I would give you a couple of action points based on the truths contained in these ten words. Call up one person that you should have called a long time ago, but you've pushed it off. Don't live with the regret of what if. Identify one commandment that you currently perform by rote. For instance, maybe you're married and not committing adultery, it's, it's, not a, it's a no-brainer for you. I mean, it's a challenging to you. It doesn't, you know, great. But you still could be performing it by rote. Pick one commandment, one connection to God that you do, but you just do it because you do it. You just do it by rote. For the next week, begin your day by meditating on the importance, the power, and the beauty of that command. What's really behind it? Why is it that way? What connection is being established through it? And try to reconnect to it rather than just doing it rote. All right. We will conclude there for this week as we have looked at portion Yitro, the giving of the Ten Commandments, but also that great event of Pentecost. This week's portion is the historical, biblical background for Acts chapter 2. All right, let's close with the blessing. Baruch atah Adonai noten HaTorah. Blessed are you, Lord God, who has given to us the gift that is the Torah. Amen. Shalom and Selah. Have a great week. See you next Monday. Hi, everyone. Thank you for engaging this teaching. You know, we at Emmanuel have as one of our goals to make our teachings available online to anyone, everywhere, at any time, whether that's through a podcast or our YouTube channel or an MP3 download. It is our gift to you, and we want you to use it however you see fit. Also, if you feel uh, motivated or desire to support future teachings, you can do so with the donate button at the bottom of our teaching page. That's found at immlutheran.org forward slash teaching. Again, thank you for participating in our teachings here and hope to see you or engage with you somehow, some way, somewhere. God bless.